All right, hey, Book of Philemon, if you've got your Bible, why don't you go ahead and take it out. I'm excited about tonight because you get to choose which man are you. A, B, C, or D, you might be all of the above, all of the above E. But we're going to go through the four guys that are represented in the book of Philemon tonight, give a little bit of history and a little bit of understanding, and you get to choose which man are you and what are you going to do about it. Which guy are you and what are you going to do about it? First, let me say, if it's your first time here, we want to say welcome. Glad you're here. Um, I know there's a few people that are coming in. Uh, who just came straight from work and you came right here? Okay, great job. Harvey, you're a good man. You're the only one that did? No one else came straight from work? Oh, God bless you. God bless you. Yep. Don't you wish there were tacos here? <laughs> just saying. I walked in and he goes, there's no tacos, but you can have a donut. I, mean, I ate the donut, but I was thankful for, I would, yeah, okay. All right, Philemon, let's get back to it. Before we do it, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for your great word. Because you tell us how to live life. And it's the abundant life that you want from every man in this room. You want to give abundant life to every man in this room. Not mediocre life. Not miserable life. But abundant life. And so as we study your word, we desire that abundant life. Free from sin. And no matter what happens filled with an inexpressible joy and a peace that passes understanding. Give us the grace to know your word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, I'm going to sign out a bunch of verses. You're going to have to say them loud enough. This is a little participation, all right? So who can take 1 Corinthians 11? If no hands go up, I'm just going to pick, all right? 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Thank you, James. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Who's got Acts chapter 16, verse 9? Acts 16, okay, it's all you. Acts 16.9, Acts 18.9. All right, very good. Acts 18.9, Acts, I feel like I'm at an auction. Acts 23.11. Do we got it once? Do we got it? Okay, it's all you. Acts 23.11, Acts 27. 23 and 24. Acts 27, verse 23, 24. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Acts 26.19, Acts 26.19, Harvey's got that. Acts 26, 19. All right, that we'll start there. Let's talk first about Paul. We're going to talk about Paul. We're going to talk about Timothy. We're going to talk about Philemon. And we're going to talk about Onesimus. You get to decide which man are you. Now, when Paul writes this letter to Philemon, his friend, the Bible says he's a little older. He's grown a little bit in his testimony. And Paul makes an exhortation to the church. Um, James, would you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1? You, James. Yes, you, James. Uh, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Excellent. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. So I want to take a look at Paul's life, and I want to see the testimony of his life. If you take a look at Philemon, verse 9. Philemon, verse 9, take a look. Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, being such a, such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul is in the seasoned latter years of his life. He is about to die right before he writes this letter to Philemon. He's going to be beheaded in Rome. And Paul says, listen, I'm old now. And he's looking back on his life and he realizes, hey, Philemon, I want to write a letter to you. I'm an older guy. And in this culture, I want you to respect me and I want you to hear my heart. But the point I want to bring out is Paul spent his Christian life building a testimony. And I want to prove the kind of testimony that Paul built. Now that he's an older man, we can see throughout the book of Acts. Who had Acts 16.9? Acts chapter 16, verse 9. Who had it? Yes, go for it. Excellent. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. If you're taking note, listen carefully. Paul was led by the Spirit. He was on his way to Messiah. The Spirit said, no. 
He was on his way to Bithynia. The Spirit said no. And then he had a vision in the Spirit, and it was a man calling from him from Macedonia, and he knew that he was supposed to go to Macedonia. Paul was led by the Spirit. He knew who was inside of him, and who was inside of him was directing his every move. You know this. You know when the Spirit is telling you, don't watch that. You know when the Spirit is telling you, don't speak to your wife like that. You know when the Spirit is telling you, get up and go to men's life. You know when the Spirit is speaking to you, have tacos at men's life. (laughs) Just saying. Sometimes the Spirit looks like a pastor. (laughs) The Spirit of God... You know him because he's speaking to you and guiding you each step of the way. It's called conviction. You ever felt it before? You ever been in the middle of something and you feel convicted that it's not the right thing to do? Have you ever been in the middle of something wrong and you know it's wrong? Have you ever been in the middle of something that, you, uh, that you're not a part of and the Spirit says you need to be a part of? Paul was led by the Spirit. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Listen to this. Acts chapter 18, verse 9. Who's got that one? Acts 18. Go for it. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul was directed by the word of Jesus. He was afraid. His feeling was being activated. He was afraid to do the work. The great apostle Paul, the spirit of the word of God came to him and said, do not be afraid. And he pressed on doing what Jesus told him to do. Sometimes as men, we've got to be careful that our feelings don't take over our faith. Our faith needs to take over our feelings. We need to let our faith tell our feelings how to behave and not let our feelings tell our faith how to behave. You ever been hangry? (laughs) You wish there were tacos here too, don't you? Have you ever been hangry? Like you're just hungry and you're angry. And you're just mad at the world. Until you get that taco in you, it's like you're just mad at everything called Albert. (laughs) Albertsons. Yeah, until you get that rotisserie. And how many of you bought the rotisserie at Albertsons and on your way home, half of it's gone before you even got there and your steering wheel's got like oil all over it, right? You guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? Huh? How many of you are like, it's like you're eating your hamburger and you got like in and out all over you, okay? Listen, Paul was led by faith, not by feelings. And the idea here is, is that when feelings say, be angry, you say, that's not of the Spirit of God. And I'm going to choose to go the way of faith, not the way of my feelings. Who had Acts chapter 23, verse 11? Acts 23, 11, go for it. Paul was a witness for Christ while he was in jail. It didn't matter where he was. It didn't matter who he was with. He was a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. When he went to work, he was going on the mission field. When he went on vacation, he was going on the mission field. When he was going to the store, he was going on the mission field. His whole life was about coming in contact with humanity to give them a message that Jesus Christ died for him. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And now he's older and we see the experience of his life that he was a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I've spoke to so many of you in the last few months who have, for the first time in your life, told someone about Jesus. And you should see your face. (laughs) I told someone. I mean, it's unbelievable how excited you are to let me know that you led someone someone to the Lord. That was Paul's life, thick or thin. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Listen to this, Acts 27, verse 23 and 24. Who had that one? Acts 27, go for it. I'm reading out the NLT. That's okay. Uh, for last night, an angel of the God 
to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God, it will be just as he said. But we will be shipwrecked on an island. Paul hasn't seen the sun in 14 days. We don't know how long they were in the storm. It only reports that Paul had not seen the sun for 14 days. And there he was in prayer, and we know that he was in prayer because the Bible says, it has been granted to you. He was praying for the very people that wanted him dead. They wanted to throw all the prisoners overboard. But Paul was praying for them, and the Bible says that the angel came and said to him, Everyone that you've been praying for, it's been granted unto you, your request. Listen up, guys. Paul was a man of prayer. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul was a man of prayer. Do we have a regular routine of prayer? Paul was a man of prayer. But I want you to see, read this, Acts chapter 26, verse 19. Acts 26, 19. We know that he was supposed to go to Caesar. How many of you, God calls you and said, hey, you're going to go minister to the king of England and you're going to tell him about Jesus. You're going to go to the president of the United States and you're going to tell him about Jesus. You're going to go to the ruler of the whole world at the time and you're going to tell him about Jesus. Now, you know what the Bible says about Paul? The Bible says that he was a short Jewish man. He had knocked knees and a hunchback. That's what Clement wrote of Paul. Now just imagine him walking up to uh, Caesar, the Roman ruler. Think about how self-conscious this guy was, but he was obedient. Listen to this. It's Matthew, Acts chapter 26, or sorry, Acts um, 26, 19. Who had it? He was obedient. No matter what God told him to do, he was obedient to do it. Have you ever had that flutter in you and God's telling you to do something and you don't do it? Paul was obedient to do it. Have you ever been in that place with your wife where she has pressed T minus 10? Like she just said, you walked home, you came home from a hard day's worth of work and you come home and your wife looks and you goes, why didn't you take the garbage out? T minus 10, 9, 8, there's going to be an explosion, 6, 5. I mean, have you ever had that experience where you've got a moment of time, you've got a choice, am I going to launch or am I going to call off the launch? Paul says, I was obedient to the heavenly vision. I did what God asked me to do, even when it was uncomfortable. So we see from the aged Paul that he's a man of prayer. We see he was led by the Spirit. He's directed by the Word. We see in Scripture that he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, something that is implicit into the book of Philemon is that Paul grew in faith. And I want to point it out to you. It's Philemon. I'm going to read verse 8 and 9 again. Philemon 8 and 9. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake... I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged, so I'm older, and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. I want you to see this. 2 Peter chapter 1. Just over a few pages. 2 Peter chapter 1. I want you to see something in verse 5. Paul is older, and Paul has grown. Let me talk about Paul for just a minute. Do you remember the beginning of his ministry? He got into a fight with Barnabas. Do you remember it? The guy that discipled him, the guy that presented him to the disciples, the guy that said, I got Paul's back. Paul gets into a fight. Let me tell you why. Paul had an anger problem. Paul had an anger problem. Do you remember before he was saved what he was doing? What was he doing? Let me tell you something. It takes a mean, angry person to rip apart a family and put them in the gladiator's arena. And at the beginning of Paul's ministry, he gets into a full-on fight with Barnabas. Then, Galatians chapter 1, you know what he says? I withstood Peter to his face. 
You know that in the Greek, you know what that means? I was ready for a fight. When you go up to someone and you stand in their face, what are you saying to them? Your chest is out and you've got them up in their face. Steve does it to me all the time. He tries to intimidate me every single Sunday. <laughs> Comes up to me and does one of these things. And then I hide behind Zach. And I'm like, I'm kidding. Zach hides behind me. It's... <laughs> He goes up to Peter and he stood up to his face. But now in Philemon he says, look, I can tell you what to do, but I'm going to plead for you on love's sake. Something happened with Paul as he grew in Christ. Take a look at 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 5. Gentlemen, this verse is the goal of this year. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge, verse 6. First Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these are things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, don't tell me that you know him. Show it to me. And he says, add to your faith. And he says, the pinnacle of faith, the way everyone will know that you are of Jesus Christ, is love. Your faith should look like Love. And over the course of Paul's ministry, he went from an angry little man to a very loving man. Where he withstood Peter to his face, where he was in a fight with Barnabas over a kid. And Paul's a discipler. Paul was a discipler and he got into this argument. Now as he has grown in Christ, he's become a loving man. Much like the son of thunder, John, became the apostle of love. So when you go home to your wife, if you're married, or your friends, something should happen over the course of the next six months where your wife or your friends start telling you, man, you're different. You don't get angry as much. You're not as frustrated as you usually were. Well, I've grown in the knowledge of Christ. And as you grow in the knowledge of Christ, you look more loving. That was the apostle Paul. Let's talk about Timothy. Look, go back with me if you would to Philemon. Take a look at Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ and Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Timothy, our brother. Let's talk about Timothy for just a moment. Young teenage kid. His dad was a Gentile. His mom and his grandmother were believers. And so God brings Paul into his life, a father in the faith, to disciples, disciple him. Now let me tell you something about discipleship. Discipleship must be in the context of family. It must be in the context of family. Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. Who can read it for me? Matthew 12. Who can look it up for me? Matthew 12, 50. Going once, twice. Thank you very much. Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. Read it loud enough for me. Who can um, pick up for me 2 Timothy 2.2? 2, 2. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, right here. Scott's got it. Scott, I'm glad that they said your name, wrote your name down. Okay? All right, Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. Go for it. Good. Discipleship happens in the context of family. I want you to take a look at everybody in this room as believers. You're brothers with the people that are, sta- are sitting next to you. They're family. And discipleship happens in the context of family. And when they tell you what family means, you're all up in everybody's business. There are no secrets in my family. Absolutely none. My kids can't, I mean, I I know, I just got a phone call from one of my daughters. You know that so-and-so just broke up with so-and-so? No, I didn't, but thanks for telling me. Gave my other daughter a call. Are you okay? Oh, how did you know? Well, you told your sister. Oh, That's what family is. You're all up in everybody's business. And discipleship happens in the context of family. And let me tell you what that means. It means transparency and it means vulnerability. 
and Timothy, our brother. Now, let me tell you what transparency and vulnerability and hanging out with each other as brothers will do. Now, I'm going to read it. You can stay in uh, Philemon. I'm going to read to you Philippians chapter 2, verse 20. Listen to what Philippians 2, 20 says. Speaking of Timothy, Philippians chapter 2, verse 20. For I have, speaking of Timothy, no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. We've got to keep family in context if we are going to choose to invest into each other. The person sitting next to you as a believer is your brother. Go ahead and look at them. Look how different they are. Some are old. Some are young. Some don't bring tacos. Some are very old. Ken. <laughs> now here's why this is important. Because discipleship is not a calling. It's a responsibility. Did you hear what I just said? Because if some people have said to me, well, I'm not called to disciple. That's not true. You're commanded to. Go and make disciples. And as we talked about last week, every single one of us should be in some form of discipleship relationship. Now listen to what the Apostle Paul said. Who, who, turned, who did 2 Timothy 2 to? Go for it, Scott. Excellent. What you heard from me, you're responsible to share with someone else. Gentlemen, did you hear that? I taught you, now you go teach someone else. We have a responsibility to share what we know with someone we know. We have a responsibility to share what we know. Let me tell you what it does. It solidifies what you know. When you teach someone else, it further puts it inside of you. When you, Well, I don't know a lot. Well, share the one thing that you do know. Because we have a responsibility to share with our brothers. Now, go back with me to Philemon. Well, you're still there, Philemon. What amazes me is that Timothy is a prisoner with Paul. But Timothy's not the one convicted. I love this. Paul was the prisoner in Rome. He was the prisoner of Christ, and Timothy chose to be in jail with him. You guys know I, I've, I've gone to Iran twice. Who wants to go with me? When I go, I use my Bahamian passport. I don't use my American passport. And when I go into Iran, I am terrified. And I passed by the jail where they keep all the Christians in Tehran. And while I'm in Tehran, I have done pastor's conferences. I did a pastor's conference in a sauna. And we turned up the heat, all the Iranians left, and me and the pastors went through the entire book of Ephesians. I lost 50 pounds that pastor's conference. I did a pastor's conference in a taxi. The taxi driver was a pastor. He picked up a guy who was another pastor, and I did a pastor's conference as we drove around Tehran for four hours. Now, when I get arrested, who's going with me? And I want you to think for just a moment of the commitment of this young man to say, I'm with you, Paul. I'm learning from you, I want to grow from you, and I'm with you. So much so that Paul writes, and did, did I call out 2 Timothy 3.10? Did someone have that? In 2 Timothy 3.10, he writes to T uh, Timothy, he's writing another letter to Timothy, and he says to him, you've been faithful to follow. Let me tell you something about this year. You've got to be committed 
Can you be committed to change? Can you take a look at your life and can you be committed to be faithful to change? I actually want to read this to you in 2 2 Timothy because it's a letter that Paul writes. And listen to what he says in chapter 3, verse 10. You have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering love, perseverance, persecutions, and afflictions. You have faithfully followed. Are you willing to do that? Are you a Paul who will lead people by example, or are you a Timothy who will be faithful to change, to become something different, to get a new name in your testimony, no longer hangry but loving? Are you willing to actually take a look at yourself and realize there are things about you that are not godly, that this year you're going to make a commitment no matter what it costs, just like Timothy, that you're willing to change. So you can be Paul, you can be Timothy. But what about Philemon? Let me tell you a little about Philemon. We only know the details of his life because of this one little one-page letter. We don't know anything else about Philemon in history outside of this letter. We do know one thing, he's wealthy. He has a house, and this house is big enough that a church is in it, and Paul writes in Philemon, when I come, prepare your guest room. So we know that he was Roman, and we know that he was a very wealthy Roman because he had a house, in, he had a church in his house, and he also had a guest room that was attached to the house. So we know, as well, he was a slave owner. And a slave, just a working slave at the time, was worth 500 denarii. That was the lowest price. Now let me tell you what a denarii was. One day's worth of work. So he would spend over a year and a half's worth of money on one. So we know this guy was a wealthy man. Now you need to understand something about slavery in the Roman world. There were more slaves in the Roman world than there were freedmen. So in any given village or town, if there were 10,000 people, 2,000 or 25, 2 to 2,500 were freed Romans. The rest of them were slaves. So we know that Philemon was a very wealthy man. There was a church in his house. We also know that Paul led him to the Lord. He says, listen, you know what I've done for you. In Philemon, we're going to learn that Paul led him to the Lord. We also know that Philemon was possibly the leader of this church because Paul writes him and says to him, you have been encouraging the people in the church. So this is probably Pastor Philemon. So he's using his money for God and he's got wealth, he's got a house, he's got a guest room. This guy is like one of the wealthy businessmen in the Roman world. So this isn't like down and out Paul in prison. This isn't young little Timothy. This is a guy that's got it all together. And Paul is writing this man a letter. And he says to him, going back to Philemon, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. I want to pick that apart just for a moment, a beloved friend. Not only are we family and need to look at each other as brothers, can we be friends? This world has lost the art of friendship. It blows my mind, the amount of people that I say hello to as I'm passing, and there's no response. When the island I grew up on, seven by 21 miles, you could not pass a car without lifting your hand. It's just etiquette, it's just culture. Imagine I came to the States, like no one even, like I'm like this, you just imagine me on the uh, 405, I'm like, <laughs> like doing this the whole time, right? I mean. Can you imagine, every, everyone I say hello to, there's absolutely no response. I know we're family, but you've got family that you're not friends with. You know who I'm talking about. You don't have to call out their name. It's that person that you don't want to invite to the wedding, but they're in the family. Paul is talking about Philemon. He says, you're not only a brother, you're also my friend. And this is important because Paul is about to challenge the life out of Philemon. 
Because discipleship happens best in friendship. When people know that you care about them, they're willing to listen to you challenge them. Friendship is important. And Paul is about seriously to challenge the life out of him. What Paul is about to ask Philemon to do is unheard of in the Roman world. Now, let me tell you about a friend. Friends are people that you want to spend time with. Friends are people that you want to talk to. Has someone ever walked towards you and you, you're doing everything you can to walk the other way or pretend like you don't see them? You have those people in your life? Now, I'm a pastor. I don't have those people. <laughs> Watching out for lightning. You know what I'm talking about, right? But as believers, we're not called just to be brothers. We're also called to be friends. Because there might come a time in your life or my life where a friend, we sharpen each other's iron. And we're in relationship where we come to each other and we say, this needs to change. It's different. If I'm, I, Michael is a good friend of mine. And if there's something in Michael's life, I know he would receive from me. And if there was something in my life, I would receive from him because he is a friend of mine. And it happens best in the context of friends. But guys don't make friends. Girls, they got no problem. They even go to the bathroom together. It's so weird. <laughs> You're out for dinner with like three other wives, and one goes, I need to go to the bathroom. And they all get up and go to the bathroom. Can you imagine if a guy did that? I'm going to go to the bathroom. All three guys, they go to the bathroom and be like, okay, we got a problem. <laughs> Seriously, think about it. Women have no problem automatically connecting, becoming kindred spirits. We got walls. We're tough. We're strong. And becoming friends, like, I need to know who you are. We're family, but we also need friends because this year we want a purpose to grow, which means we're going to have to speak into each other's lives. So he's a beloved friend, but he's also, take a look at him, a fellow worker or fellow laborer. You see, we find out in Philemon that Paul had ministered with Philemon. And the best way to get to know someone is serve together. So come to the baptism. And this is a shameless plug for volunteers. But come to the baptism, and when the tent falls on someone's toe and a curse word comes out of their mouth because you're serving together, you know you got some discipleship. Hey, brother, come on, let's talk a little bit. You know what I'm talking about. Or when you're working on a project and the hammer hits your thumb and something comes out of your mouth, but you're working together and now your brother knows as you're serving together that you have something that needs to be changed or discipled. That's why I love going on mission trips. The real person always comes out the fourth day of a mission trip. They're tired, they're exhausted, they don't want to wake up and go serve, they're hot and they're sweating, and now they're serving the Lord in you name it where you are, and they just don't want to get up. Brett's shaking his head. He knows exactly what we're talking about. So I love serving together because you get to know the person well that you're serving with. The best way to get to know someone is by serving. We are to be working for the Lord. Listen to what Nehemiah said. Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, he said this, For we built the wall to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Do you know why God told Adam, go to work? Because men are typically lazy. Do you know why God told Eve, he's now your leader? Because women like to lead. And by telling the man, you need to go to work, it made Adam dependent on God. And by telling the woman, you've got to submit to authority, it made the woman dependent on God. Gentlemen, having a mind to work is what I'm asking for you from this year. To go to work on your spirit so that you become more like Christ this year, more than any other year of your life. But you got to have a mind to work. And there's two things that I want you to work at. 
The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study to show yourself approved a worker who does not need to be ashamed. I'm asking you to work in the word. Work in the word. Let your Bible be ripped up by the end of this year. And let your phone have a finger mark on it. Whatever word that you are in, I want you to work at the word of God. Don't let it just come from the pulpit. You study the word of God. You know, as your pastor, I listen to a sermon six days out of the week as another pastor is investing into me. I'm reading my scripture, I'm studying for the sermon, but outside of that, I'm listening to other pastors minister to me. I want to work in the word because I don't want to be a good pastor. I want to be a good follower of Jesus. That's my goal, and that should be all of our goals, not just the pastor's goal. But the second thing that I want us to work at is to work in the world. To work in the world. You know what Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 15? I'm not praying that you take him out of the world. That's what he says to God. I'm not asking you to take him out of the world. I'm asking you to protect him. I'm sending him out as sheep amongst wolves. God has called us to be in the world to shine as a light. So go to work. Advance the kingdom of God in the world that God has placed you. Each of us have a job to do in this world. And it's going to take a mind to go to work. Now remember I told you that Paul was going to challenge Philemon. Let me tell you why this is such a big deal. I've read the book. First century, first century author. He wrote a book on how to handle your slave. There was such a big, there were so many more slaves than there were freedmen in the Roman world that everyone was, Roman freedmen were always afraid that the slaves would revolt. So they kept them subjugated. And if you did anything wrong, they threw you in the gladiator's arena and you were just there to die. And I read this book, How to Treat Your Slave in the First Century World. If they drop a dish, cut their hand off. That was Roman rule. They were vicious. Vicious. I won't go on with the rest of the book. But Philemon was going to be asked by Paul to receive his slave, not as a slave, but as a brother. Philemon would be ousted from the rest of the Roman community because they expected Philemon to treat Onesimus harshly so that their slaves wouldn't do the same thing that Onesimus did. He's asking Philemon to go counter culture, to do something different, to be a Christian and not a Roman. This is a big deal. And then there's Onesimus. Now let me tell you a little bit about Onesimus. Onesimus was a runaway slave who stole something from Philemon. Big deal. He was a runaway slave who stole something from Philemon because Paul says, listen, if he's taken anything from you, and this is a Jewish way to say, I know he took something. If he's taken anything away from you, let it come from my account. I'll pay it. Besides, you owe me your own life also. In other words, I led you to Christ. You owe me your eternity, so put it on my account. Classic Jewish way, guilt trip. Classic Jewish guilt trip in the book of Philemon. Now, I told you there were strict rules for the governance of slaves in Rome. Now, when Onesimus runs away, surprise, surprise, he runs into the Apostle Paul in Rome. Paul's in jail. And either Onesimus was in jail, or he was working at the jail, or something happened where he comes in contact with the Apostle Paul, and there was the Apostle Paul. I can't believe I'm in jail. I'm so frustrated about this whole thing. No, oh, just give me my food, Onesimus, and get out of here. No, when Onesimus would show up with the food, Onesimus, so glad to see you again today. Would you like to hear more about Jesus? Paul used his prison experience to lead Onesimus to the Lord. How do you handle disappointing times? 
How do you handle when the, your day doesn't go your way? Um, I, on Mondays is my yard day, and so I was doing my weed. I hate my weed eater. I hate it. And it, the line never comes out. So I thought to myself, I'm, and I, I went to Home Depot. I had to get a whole new spool because the other spool broke, and then I'm feeding the line in it. I, then I broke the little thing. I had to go back to Home Depot, get another thing. And I, I'm not an invalid when it comes to the, to the lawn, but yesterday was just my day. So then I spooled the whole line in, and I go to Weedy. The line releases and whips me, whips my foot. I got a choice. Do I throw this weed eater through it? Like, what? I, I can feel, I even tell myself, you have a Bible study tomorrow, you're going to be talking about this. Be a good example, Chet. And I'm using my accountability with you all so that I can use my, now let me tell you something. I'm a little embarrassed of myself of what was happening internally, but I passed the test. No, you don't need to clap. Because I'm embarrassed of myself what happened inter inter in internally. But how do you handle when your day goes wrong? How do you handle your disappointments in life? Paul, he turned it into an opportunity. He made his obstacle an opportunity, and he ministered to Onesimus, and Onesimus gets saved. But now, Onesimus is a new believer. Keep this in mind. Now, how many of you have been walking with the Lord for a year or less? Year or less, all right? Five years or less. Ten years or less. Fifteen years or less. Twenty years or less. Thirty years or less. All right, Samuel, eighty years or less. <laughs> Onesimus just comes to Christ. And Paul looks at him and goes, you got to make your wrong right go back to Philemon. He's going to cut my arm off. I want you to think what Paul's asking him. He pointed something out in his life and he said to him, you got to go back to Philemon. Paul, I ran away from that guy. You got to go back to Philemon. Do you know what he's going to do to me? you got to go back to Philemon. Paul, like, I ran away from there. Do you realize what they do to people like me when they return? Think of what Paul is asking this new believer. He says to Onesimus, go make your wrong right. And we struggle with apologizing to our wives. We struggle with being honest at work. My son came up to me the other day and he goes, Dad, I had a moment. I'm like, all right, Tommy, what happened? Well, I cheated on a test. And I couldn't believe it. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do? And then he goes, then I remembered your story. I cheated on a test in college. It was my physics exam. Physics to me might as well be hieroglyphics. I am not a physics my brain. I took, I took physics for complete dummies. Not dummies, complete dummies. That was my physics class in college. And there was an exam, and I cheated. I didn't actually cheat. I did the problem, but then I just looked to make sure that she got what I got. <laughs> and she did. And she was smart. I was on a swimming scholarship, and the Lord really convicted me. So I went to a friend of mine, and I confessed it, thinking, I'll just get this off my chest. So I confessed it. They looked at me, and they go, I did the same thing at Duke University. And I went back to the school and I told them and they took my degree from me. So I looked at them and I said, okay, you're the wrong person that I should have confessed to. <laughs> and I was convicted. 
So I went to my physics professor, I sat down and I said, hey, I'm a Christian and I cheated on the exam. And he looked at me and he goes, you're a swimmer, aren't you? You're on scholarship, right? And he goes, you just lost your scholarship because you're going to get kicked out of the school. I started to cry. And I said, this is, I just literally said this. I go, this is not how it's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to tell you I'm a Christian and then you get saved and come to Jesus. That's how this whole thing out. I literally said that out loud. And he just turned around and he started typing on his computer. I sat there. I couldn't move for 45 minutes. And he turned around and he looked at me and he said, look, I'm going to fail you for the exam. It's going to be almost impossible for you to pass this course. But I'm not going to. I won't communicate this, now get out of my office. I did everything I could to pass that, that, that next exam. It was only a midterm and a final. And by the grace of God, I got like a 95 on the, and I was able to get like a, I think it was like a D plus, and I was able to get out of physics. That was my goal, get out of physics. <laughs> my son comes to me and he goes, Dad, remember the story when you cheated? I said, yeah. I was really convicted, so I went to my teacher. I'm like, son, it's only your second week of school and you cheated? <laughs> and I confessed to my teacher that I used my book in the exam. And I go, what happened? And I'm thinking he's about to, because he came home. So I'm thinking he got kicked out of college, like the whole deal. And he goes, well, my teacher told me it was an open book exam, so we're good. <laughs> I almost punched him in the face. I'm like, you kept me going. Like, you, you kept me going in this. But you know what? I'm proud of him. Because though it was a hard decision, it was the honorable thing to do. And I'm wondering this year, are you willing to make your wrongs right? no matter what it costs you? Are you willing to become honorable and have integrity? Because this new believer not only carried this letter, but he also carried the letter to the Colossian church with Tychicus. Colossians chapter 4, he carried two letters that we have in our New Testament that is changing our lives tonight a new believer. So I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord. Isn't it time to turn, make your wrongs right? Instead of living in, that's just who I am, if it's wrong, why not change? Onesimus did. At the cost, potentially, of his life. Can you imagine Onesimus walking in with the letter? How do you think that welcome went? Can you imagine Philemon's face as Onesimus hands him the letter? And he, if I, just imagine Philemon, oh, oh, dude, you hurt me, my wife, my child, everything. And he's reading this letter. Oh, great. <laughs> because both the long-standing believer and the new believer were being challenged by Paul to change. And that's what I'm doing. I'm challenging all of us to change. Because God wants you to not just have eternal life. He promises abundant life. You don't got to live in guilt anymore. You don't got to live in wonder. You can make right decisions by the power of the Holy Spirit, and it may hurt. I was talking to a guy a couple days ago. He's in a relationship with someone, but the girl he really wants came back. And he came to me with, what do I do? And I said, this is not a question of girlfriends. This is a question of your character. Because you're already talking to the girl that came back, and neither one of them know what you're doing. This is not an issue of girls. This is a question of your character. Are you willing to make the hard decision? 
And he did. With a lot of tears, a lot of confession, and a lot of hurt on his end, he made the right decision. He honored the Lord. Now, are you willing to do the same? Am I? Why not do it together? We're brothers and we're friends. Amen. Amen. Father, I'm just so thankful for this group of men and so thankful that we have the book of Philemon to study. I believe we're going to grow and grow together. So I pray, Lord, that we would make our wrongs right. As you're in an attitude of prayer, I got to believe that the Holy Spirit has already pointed out to you what wrong needs to become right. And if not, why don't you ask him? Are you harsh? Are you jealous? Are you a gossiper? Are you a slanderer? Are you unforgiving? What's your wrong? And are you willing to make it right? Why don't we take this year to see that change in our lives? Let's be brothers. Let's be friends. And let's rejoice together as we all change. Just ask the Spirit now, what's the one thing that you know needs to change? And as the Lord gives you that one thing, just raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. I'm just going to wait for the Spirit to speak to all of us. The one thing, just raise your hand in surrender. You know the one thing that needs to change in your life. Yeah, I see everyone's hands. What's the one thing that needs to change? So Lord, now with all of our hands up, we recognize there's something about us that doesn't look like you. And we're serious. As serious as Onesimus was to walk towards his death. As serious as Philemon was to go counter culture. I just pray now. Change our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.